Hello, and welcome to Ben Church's online worship service for July 17th, 2022. Here at Ben Church, you are welcomed and affirmed no matter where you are on your faith journey. Would you join me now in an attitude of prayer? God, for everything there is a time, and time is now our most precious commodity. Our clocks are always running from birth to death, during times of joy and sorrow, work and play, business and pleasure, speech and silence, worship and church activities, tick, tock, tick, tock. We are like Martha with our long to-do lists. Slow us down, Lord, and for now, simply remind us that one thing is needful, that we be still before you and know that you are God. Amen. Good morning. Glad to see you all. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious and loving God, may your scriptures be my delight always. May I not be deceived by them. May I not deceive with them. Amen. The scripture I'm reading this morning is from the message, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, but it comes to a more everyday language. Reading from Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered her village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in, interrupting him. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. Only one thing is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. How are we doing? Good. good. Yeah, there's good energy in here today. Um, say welcome to the people who will watch this later, y'all. I never knew I was going to be a TV evangelist. Here we are. So, as I have told you before, I grew up until I was almost 13 in Miami, Florida. And so, um, it's different than growing up in Oregon, I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> there were weekly trips to the beach, and uh, when I was growing up, we went to church, my whole family together, uh, my parents, me and my sister, and my grandparents who lived just down the street from the church, and my aunt and my cousin. And uh, we went to Raider Memorial United Methodist Church. And when we went to church, uh, there was only one service. We all went together, and then after every uh, church service, we would head back to my grandparents' house to have supper. Not dinner, to have supper. And Grandma would... Uh, be thinking about what we were going to have for supper all week long. Um, she was not the most fabulous cook in the world, but we would be fed and we would be full. And so we would get home from church to at my grandparents' house, and my sister and I would change clothes, and we would go onto the back lawn and water the orchids, and we would uh, try and uh, pull avocados and oranges from the trees, so that uh, my parents could eat them during our supper. I, of course, would not even think about touching an avocado at that time. And uh, my, all of the women would gather into my grandmother's very small kitchen. It was a house that my grandfather had actually built in 1950, between 1950 and 1952, they built this, I'm gonna say it was maybe a thousand square foot home. 
that eventually they put a Florida room on the back. Uh, I don't know if you uh, have a Florida room. You maybe do, and you just don't even know it. But in Florida, there's a Florida room at the back of the house that often when people had built houses in the 50s, uh, when they had a little more money in the 60s or in the 70s, they would build these big rooms in the back that would be open to the breezes that flew through Miami all, all year long. And so uh, the men would gather in the Florida room and get ready to start watching the football games. Um, I grew up watching the Miami Dolphins, the greatest football team. <laughs> they throw the ball from goal to goal like no one's ever seen. They're in the air, they're on the ball, they're always in control. And when you say Miami, you're talking Super Bowl. I could sing the whole thing, but I'll, I'll stop that. So my sister and I would um, try to help get things ready for the dining room table was also in the Florida room. And so we would take the salad and bring it to the table and the Italian dressing and the French dressing. And uh, grandma would get the turkey or the roast beef and the potatoes ready and we would put those on the table. And the entire time the women are talking in the kitchen and the men are already screaming at um, the football games. But when we had supper together, you had to turn the television off and we all gathered around the table and my grandfather would normally uh, lead the prayer and my uh, grandmother would uh, not let him into the kitchen. <laughs> and then we would have supper after grandpa had said the prayer and we would pass the dishes around and it was this um, precious time that I remember in my life, this time with family where we could all be together. But after supper was over, the men would immediately go back to the football game and the women had to clean up. And that was not cool with my grandmother. <laughs> she was fine with the women helping set the table. But if the men did not help clean up, there were issues in that house. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Martha is performing her socially mandated role. Um, although women did not have a lot uh, to say outside of the household, inside the household in these times, the women were uh, the leaders. And so uh, instead of following her sister, I imagine that Martha was the head of this household. Her sister chose to learn and sit at the feet of Jesus as he was teaching. Uh, and sitting at the feet of Jesus, like maybe watching the football game, is a more typically uh, male choice, at least in the 1970s when I was growing up. But what happens with this story so often is that women are pitted against each other in the ways that we talk about it. You know, Martha's mad at her sister. And I don't necessarily think that we have to think about this story in that way. Luke does such a good job, the, the writer of the story of, of giving names to women, more so than any of the other Gospels, of naming them and of, of giving us just a little slice of what their lives were like. I also don't think this is about uh, contemplation, Mary contemplating what Jesus says and, and Martha uh, acting. We don't all need to become contemplative sitting at the feet of Jesus for hours every day. Instead, I think this passage is about where we put our focus. Jesus cares about our motives and our focus in our lives. And he cares about whether what we are doing comes from a place of love or a place of of obligation. Notice when he's talking with Martha that it's her frustration that he addresses, not what she or her sister are necessarily doing. 
By criticizing her sister for leaving her alone, she is judging her sister to focus. Judging her sister for focusing on the one thing that is necessary. And the one thing in Christian lives is Jesus. God made flesh the way. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, there is so much to distract us, to divide us, to set us against one another. Remind us of you and your way. Help us to see and hear one another with open eyes and open hearts. Amen. So our task if we choose to take it on today, is to remember that we are called to be Martha and to be Mary. There is work to be done. But if we are to be ready for that work, then we must remember why we do this work together, why we are a congregation. And, and we can think about that. There was a training, I know David's done this training as well, that I got to do a couple of years ago that talked about the, the work of the church as sort of a, a triangle, right? Our job is to love God, to love our neighbors, and to make disciples, to spread that love. But the church is more like, you know, a square. There is the staff and the building and the programs and the systems that we create in a church. And all of these things that happen in a building need to happen so that we can make disciples and love each other. That's why we do what we do, <laughs> so that we can better love each other and better spread that love. Amen? So those things don't have to be in competition with one another. Theologian uh, Chang Suk Ja believes that the most important part should be understood from the perspective of partnership. For Jesus, the role distinction was not a, a big issue, who was cooking or who was sitting, but the broken partnership between Martha and Mary, that's what needed to be addressed. So for instance, in this church, I am focusing my time, uh, or a great deal of my time, now on restarting our youth group. That does not mean that I don't care about all of the other things going on. Doesn't mean that I don't care about our open door ministries, or any of the other thousand things that happen in this church on a weekly, daily basis. Sometimes it means that I must focus on what I'm called to do. This fall, there is going to be a focus on getting us back together in small groups and, and, and Bible study. Woo! Like Mary, a congregation first must sit at Christ's feet and wrestle with these scriptures together so that we can do the work of loving God and neighbor and making disciples. We need to remember why we do what we do. And reflection and action are two sides of the same spiritual coin. When they are separated, things fall apart and we question each other's motives and bitterness ensues. You've seen this. If you've been part of any group, but especially a church, you've seen this happen before. So why is Martha mildly rebuked? I would say that three times in that short passage she mentions me. It's all about her. She's so focused on getting everything done, on being the perfect host, that she forgets that Jesus is in the room. <laughs> Anyone other than me feel convicted by this? Like, I don't want anyone over at my house unless I have been able to vacuum first. This could be because I have two cats and three dogs in my house right now, and if you were to walk in right now, there are just, like, fur balls everywhere. Does this sound familiar to you? You know, 
You want everything to be perfect because you want to be hospitable. But the truth is, if you think about um, the friends' houses that you go over and that you feel comfortable with, maybe your best friends, do they like have everything picked up and cleaned every time you come over? No. My best friend knows that when I come and visit her, I expect there to be dirty floors. She better not clean everything up for me. Because then I know that she's really comfortable and that she loves me and that it's okay. She did, I don't call for perfection. She doesn't need to be perfect. When we remember to open our eyes, we find that Jesus is almost always already in the room. But in our anxiety, we forget that. And when we forget that, we lose sight of, of what we're about, which is sharing the way, sharing our stories, sharing this life, this way of life that Jesus has brought to us. When I think over the last three years that I have been sitting in, in small groups with you, or on Zoom, <laughs> I think that the Martha in this story could be any one of us. The BBS worker or um, the folks who work so hard on this building and cook the meals and prepare the table and, and go on mission trips and, 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 you, you know what I'm getting at. You are hard workers and I'm so thankful that I've gotten to share so much of um, this time and I look forward to more time actually face to face with you. What's special about those times together, if you think about your time in this church, it's the stories that we share with one another, amen? The things that I know about each one of you, the things that I wish I knew, the things that I'm excited to get to know you. When I was first here, I remember how um, George Chesley told me this story of how this building had gotten really broken down. And there were lots of uh, questions about what you all wanted to do, how you were going to um, reimagine the workings of this church together, and how you listened for the spirit together and doubled down on being a downtown church. You know, there were other churches downtown that left downtown that are now in the suburbs as much as Bend has suburbs. This congregation cares a lot. So much so that many of you are weighted down by the enormity of the tasks before us. There are so many reasons to be weighted down by those tasks. By the world right now and there is so much that must be tended to in this broken world but now is not the time to shut ourselves off emotionally from all that's happening or to get distracted and overwhelmed by all of the utterly pressing needs of ministry around us because in the height of our anxiety we might like martha lash out at those that we love we might assume that others are not sharing the load because they are called to different ministries than we are. But friends, I just remind you that we are all in this partnership together. Jesus knows and understands that like Martha, we're being pulled in a million different directions. Jesus probably knows something about those feelings too. But what we have is each other. Each of us is called in a different way to work for this kingdom of God. And there are so many ways to participate in this kingdom. We have elderly members who are now at home and are lonely and who were the worker bees of their time. And now they have to let other people do the work that they wish they could still be doing. Those members yearn not to be forgotten, to be included and welcomed and named. And then we also have young families who are exhausted. And we need them, not so much to think so that they can, you know, take over the work uh, that the elders once did, but so that 
we can share the good news with them that they don't have to work themselves to the bone, that grace is enough, and that we are here to help with the children or, or bring a meal or hold a baby or a child. Hint, hint. It's our job to let them know that it's okay to question and to cry because we've been there too, amen? <laughs> the joy of a community of faith is that we do need each other. Mary, Martha, Jesus, you, me, we need each other to do this work. We need to eat together and sit together and argue together to share our joys and our concerns. Martha, so understandably focused on the work, isolates herself, even when calling for help. It's out of a demand for assistance in labor, not out of recognition. She is alone. She is isolated, and she just can't do it all by herself. Sound familiar? You know, in the church, when you're getting trained up to be a pastor, there is all of this work they do on talking about evangelism and how you're always supposed to like be growing the church. There needs to be more people all the time. And, and, and when I was, you know, in seminary and doing all of the things that you do as a young, you know, I was in my thirties, so I wasn't like super young, but you know, I was, I was so involved with that and so out, and I came of course out of Texas. So I'm thinking like, my job is to grow, grow, grow the church. And, and then I get into the church and I see that my job necessarily isn't to grow the church. That's, that's your job. My job is to provide space for all of us to love each other. And if we don't care about the people in this room or the people on who will watch us later, then, then we failed, right? The systems that we set up as a congregation are about care for one another. Yes, they're also about care for people outside, but if, if we don't make these connections with one another, then it's, why is that winsome? Why would anyone want to join us if, uh, if all we do is whine about one another and complain and wish somebody else would do this, that, or the other? Does that make sense? Jesus certainly wouldn't want to shame Martha for her work any more than we want to shame our faithful laborer who keeps the wheels running on the trustees committee or SPRC, but he does call her back into relationship, back to ministry that is more than just work, back to remembering no one can do it alone. And we are gonna need real community to make this a lasting effort, a sustainable effort. And in fact, it can be more than that. It can be joyful and delightful and winsome. <laughs> because we create, we create the church together, no matter what work is before us. And it's not that the work stops, the work of justice, the work of liberation, the work of healing. It's that we do it together. And we do it as a part of our shared lives, not as a bunch of individuals completing tasks. God does not call us to a life of chores, not even chores for the good. God calls us to living differently together than the world would have us live, of taking care of each other, of serving one another, because we love and know and delight in one another, and we need each other. German mystic Meister Eckhart said this, and we'll leave you with this. The two, action and contemplation, reflection, cannot truly be separated, especially when interpreted through the gospel framework. What we have gathered in contemplation, we give out in love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. If you would like to give to Ben Church, we have three ways that we invite you to give. The first is to mail a check to a secure mailbox here at the church. The second way would be to go to our website and click the e-offering button on the webpage. We also offer Venmo. 
no matter what way that you choose to give, know that your gifts of love will be used to further the gospel here in Bend and the surrounding Central Oregon area. Spirit of Christ, grant us sustained focus on what is life-giving so that restoration, joy, and mutuality may flow in our lives and in our communities. According to our abilities, we offer each other gifts of money, relationship, and labor, that it may be so. Amen. So my wrist says, be still. My two favorite scriptures are, be still and know that I am God. And also, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And I just, I really think that, you know, Jesus says over and over again that the kingdom of God is within. I think that nobody needs advice. Everybody has the answers because we all have the same amount of God inside of us. And so, really the only advice I offer is, be still. If you get quiet enough, you will know. You'll know what to do next. You'll know you're enough. You'll know it's all unfolding as it should. And um, I will tell you that I have a little girl who's a complete rule follower because in my family, in order to rebel, you follow all the rules. And. Um, she said, Mom, why'd you get that tattoo on your wrist? And I said, because be still, is just, it's something really important that I have to remind myself of every day because I forget. And she said, oh, well, you should just get a notebook. <laughs> so I wish I had thought of that first, mm -hmm. but now it's with me. And I mean, it just reminds me, it reminds me when I'm so mad at the person in front of me in the grocery line or when I'm in traffic or whenever um, I have an extra second to just Take a breath and be still. It reminds me too of the rhythm of a spiritual life, which I think is the same rhythm as creative life. I'm actually about to get here I am on this wrist because for me, um, the spiritual life has such a rhythm of quiet time where you hear what you need to hear and then the time where you go and you act it out. And then you come back and hear what you need to hear, and then you go out again. And that's sort of the yin and yang of spiritual life. And for me, in my creative life, it's so important because I would just be still all the time if it were up for me. For, to me, I would never leave my house. I'm a raging introvert, and I would, I'm borderline on hermit. And so I have to remind myself that there is a time to show up, that you may stay with God, and then you have to go with God. <laughs> and then you have to come back to the stillness. Now receive this benediction. With roots firmly planted in the soil of life and fierce dedication to thriving, may our dreams for liberation never be uprooted. We are wildflowers. We are fruit trees. We bloom, bearing the image of the holy. Amen.